Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kasim and I'm your host for today's webinar. Just to give you some, some little background, uh, this is the third installment of the Women in Africa webinar series, whose main objective is to increase awareness of and interest in the field of geoscience and remote sensing among African students and professionals. Today's speaker is Dr. Heather McNain, a senior research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Ottawa. And she has over 30 years of, ex of research experience in developing methods to monitor soils and crops using multispectral, hyperspectral, and synthetic aperture radar sensors. Today, she will deliver an inspirational talk on Don't Be Afraid to Reach for the Stars, Lessons Learned from a Career in Remote Sensing. She will discuss an overview of her research and will provide perspective on the amazing future that SAR will play in monitoring agro-systems. At this point, I welcome Dr. McNain to give her talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kasim. So let me um, attempt to share my screen here. And in presentation mode. Uh, so Kasim, can you see that okay? Yeah, we can see clearly. Excellent, okay. Um, so I, I read over actually the, the description of the webinar this morning, and um, I just wanted to um, say before I get started that um, uh, I decided to take a little bit of a, a different approach to this webinar, this presentation. And I had talked with uh, Muzmi and Kasim who helped organize this, uh, this webinar. Um, and I, I decided to make it less technical. I will give a bit of an overview in terms of the kind of science that I do, but um, I really wanted to share with the community uh, some of the experiences, some of the lessons that I've learned, uh, as Kasim had said, over the last 30 years uh, in remote sensing. So this is going to be more about um, you know, some of the lessons from my own experiences that I hope uh, you will take inspiration from and that you will learn from maybe some of the um, the mistakes that, that I've made. So with that, um, I'll get started. So before I delve into some of these lessons that I want to share with you, just a little bit of a background um, about myself. Um, so as you heard in the introduction, I'm a research scientist. I'm with one of Canada's federal uh, departments, Agriculture and Agri-Food uh, Canada. Um, so my background is, um, uh, is an environmental studies uh, undergraduate degree that I received um, uh, many years ago, followed by a bachelor's of science in, in soil science and then a PhD in geography. Um, and as we've been talking about, I've been working in this field for um, more than 30 years now. Uh, so as a scientist, uh, I have to say that not every day is exciting. Science is a bit of a grind. Uh, and you'll hear me talk about, and I share with my team often that, you know, science is about building uh, one brick at a time, um, one piece of information, one incremental um, step forward. Uh, having said that, when you're in the field of remote sensing, you do get to do some pretty cool things. So I wanted to share some of the really exciting opportunities that I've had um, over the years. Um, you'll see initially uh, on the left hand side, uh, this is a picture of me in the field. Uh, so I have spent uh, months in the fields uh, in Canada and elsewhere, uh, taking a look at the soil and, and crop conditions. And my master's uh, uh, thesis uh, supervisor told me many years ago that if you're going to work with remote sensing data, you must go to the field and see the actual conditions that um, uh, that the satellite is seeing. So I've done many, many months and weeks in the field. Uh, sometimes you get really great opportunities to work with space agencies. I've worked with NASA on a, a few different um, activities, the Canadian Space Agency as well, as well as other uh, space agencies. So these are certainly um, exciting opportunities. Um, in the middle, you see a picture of me making a presentation to the European Parliament. I was invited in 2018, one of three uh, women in the world that was invited to the uh, parliament uh, to talk about the importance of women in science. 
this is also a picture of me next uh, uh, beside one of Canada's newest uh, astronauts, Jeremy Hansen. I've met a few of Canada's astronauts and, and these are amazing people and really exciting opportunities uh, to meet and, and hear uh, from them. And on the far right side, this is a picture of me at the Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, Canada launched a constellation of satellites in 2019, um, and this is uh, me at the launch, uh, the night before the launch. So the rocket in the background um, has our, our three satellites uh, on top. Um, a lot of nerves the night before, a lot of excitement the day of the launch. So sometimes you get these exciting opportunities as well to see um, sort of the fruits of all of the, the hard work that you and your community have done over the years. Uh, so as I said, I really want to talk more about some of the lessons that I've learned. But uh, before I do that, I did want to touch upon a little bit uh, the research that I've been involved in over the years. As you heard in the introduction, I've worked on multispectral data, hyperspectral as well. Um, but really the last 20 to 25 years, I focused mostly on uh, how to use radar data to map and monitor agriculture. Uh, so a few years ago, I think it was in about 2003, the Canadian Space Agency approached me and um, with this offer, if we provide you with funding, will you develop a operational system to map um, cropland across Canada? And I thought this was an exciting opportunity. And um, I, I took that, uh, that offer from the Space Agency and uh, myself and my team worked for about three years to develop test, um, you know, the use of, of synthetic aperture radar to map crop types. Uh, so it started small, we had five sites across Canada, we developed the methods, um, tested them, validated them. Um, and then when we were sure that we had uh, a robust uh, methodology that would work over space and time, we handed off those methods to our operational team at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. They've added tremendous value uh, to those initial uh, research uh, methodologies. And now Canada delivers an operational uh, monitoring, um, or, uh, delivers operational monitoring across Canada every year. So this is approaching 15 years of operations where we map um, every field across Canada, what the crop type is. And um, importantly, all, all of these maps and, and these data are are free and open for anyone to download. Um, in addition to that, uh, myself, my team and other collaborators have been working uh, not only to be able to map uh, what crops are being grown, but also what are the condition of crops. Uh, so when we think about crop condition, we can use proxies, things like leaf area index, above ground biomass, um, or more qualitative assessments such as general crop condition. Uh, so I've worked with, as I said, uh, collaborators within and outside of Canada, Canadian industry as well, to develop some of these methodologies. Uh, what you see here uh, is a map um, that uh, my research team has developed that is mapping the condition of canola crops um, in Western Canada. Um, so this is really important to give us an assessment, not only you know, where canola is being grown, but what the health of canola is throughout the entire growing season. Uh, so those of you who um, who know me know that I have also worked for many, many years in soil moisture. Um, so we know that radar, uh, synthetic aperture radar response is um, very sensitive to the amount of water in the, the top part of the soil. So I've uh, spent many years looking at empirical, semi-empirical, theoretical modeling to estimate how much water is in the top part of the soil. Um, so just a couple of examples here. Uh, one shows some pivot irrigation. So this is a chicory field in Chile. Um, what's outlined in black is, is this chicory field. And you can see that part of that field has been irrigated and part of it um, has not. Uh, so this is soil moisture estimated from Canada's Radar Set 2 satellite using the integral equation model. So it's interesting that we're not only able to identify where the field's been irrigated, but you can see on the part of the field, uh, that blue part um, that has been irrigated, that because of the soil properties, there's differential drying of the soil. Um, so the satellites are able to detect that. And uh, the other map on the bottom, this is um, a soil moisture map derived using Canada's Radar Set 2 satellite as well, um, using the IEM model. 
Um, and here we're mapping soil moisture for a larger region in Western Canada. And you can see, for example, um, some pivot irrigation fields. And it's interesting that the soil moisture is um, not only driven by, of course, meteorological events, but also what farmers, uh, what practices they're applying on their fields, whether it's irrigation um, or tillage, for example. And the final example, uh, this is something that our department is very focused on, uh, which is um, providing information on tillage and residue cover using both optical and radar data. The reason that tillage is so important is that, um, you know, how farmers manage their fields has a very significant impact on um, soil health. So things like soil biodiversity, um, soil structure, um, the amount of organic matter in the soil. And as well, when farmers leave this protective soil or this protective residue on the soil, so they don't till the soil, um, that significantly reduces risk of uh, both wind and water erosion. So really we want to promote as much as possible the uptake of these beneficial management practices. Mm -hmm. It's also very important um, considering our um, efforts to increase um, sequestration of carbon in soils and to uh, reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in the middle, you see this color image. Uh, this is actually um, an estimate of the amount of residue left on the soil using optical satellite data. Um, you see a field that's outlined in black and you see um, most of that field is, is blue, which means it has very low amounts of residue and you see two uh, red or orange strips across that field. So this is a fascinating example that I often show. And what the satellite is detecting here um, is that the farmer's in the process of, of tilling that field. Um, so the, where he's already tilled, um, the residue has been buried. So there's very little residue left on this uh, soil surface. Um, but there are two strips in that field that have not been tilled yet. Um, and so they still have significant amounts of residue cover. And presumably the farmer will continue to till that field um, and the, uh, the amount of residue cover will be reduced across the entire field. So this is using optical data and a method called um, spectral unmixing. And on the bottom, you see um, an example of uh, using radar data to detect when fields are tilled. Um, so this is some work we've been, um, our, some most recent research we've been doing with a, uh, a contractor in Canada to look at the use of coherent change detection. So we're using the phase of radar as well as radar intensity to detect changes um, in agricultural fields. And we've been able to, de to develop this tillage alert methodology um, and we apply it to a, a time sequence of coherent uh, change products. And you can see that with that method um, and with uh, the use of radar data, we're flagging in white all of the fields that within approximately a one week period have been tilled. So that's all of the technical part that I really want to discuss in this webinar, just to get you a give you a flavor of um, some of the science that I've been involved in um, over the years. So now I want to get into maybe um, uh, some of the more interesting part of the webinar. I have four lessons to share with you. Um, and so I'm going to walk through each of these um, and uh, provide you with some of my insights through all of the uh, time that I've spent over the last 30 years in remote sensing. Lesson number one is that not everybody knows their path. Um, they may not know their path through their life and they may not know their path through their career. And I want to assure you that that is more than okay. So I want to um, share with you a little bit of my experience. So the first myth that I want to um, uh, I want to bust here is that I always knew that I wanted to be a scientist. Um, that actually was um, the furthest thing from my mind when I started my education. As I mentioned, I have a bachelor's of environmental studies. Um, I loved uh, that degree that I earned. I learned a lot about a, a lot of things um, uh, in the environmental studies field. But when I finished that four years, I swore I would never go back to school again. Um, after I earned that bachelor's degree, I had several odd jobs um, to make ends meet. 
And I actually got an offer at that time uh, from a professor to join him and to do my my master's thesis in remote sensing. And I told him there was no way I was interested to go back to school. Um, after working all of these odd jobs over uh, many months, um, I reconsidered that offer and I reached out again and, and uh, told him I would be interested in joining uh, him uh, to complete a master's of science degree. Uh, I often share this experience with my um, my colleagues and my team as well that, you know, after I finished my master's degree, I, I stayed on at the university and I worked as a research assistant at the university. And this was month to month. So what that meant is that from one month to the next, I never knew if I had a job. Um, so in the interim, I was applying for many different uh, uh, job um, opportunities. I had an offer from a company to um, basically between midnight and 8 a.m. Uh, to uh, digitize maps. Um, so some of these job offers were less than appealing, shall I say. And really in those two years working, even though it was month to month, I really started um, to, to be hooked on the inspiration that comes from, from research. And that means that you're discovering new things every day. Um, and you're, you're, you know, you're learning new skills and um, new applications of science. Um, during this time, these two years at the university, um, I accumulated a few things. Um, I got married, I had my first son, and um, I bought a house, so I had a mortgage. And so what that means is that it, I really was not in a position to, to, um, to stop working. Um, through all of that, um, because I was so intrigued with the research, um, I decided to apply for and start my PhD, and I was doing that on a, on a part-time basis. This is a pretty uphill um, journey to be working full-time um, with a family and to be doing a PhD part-time. Uh, the second myth I'd like to bust is that um, I always knew I wanted to work for the government um, in a, a research science capacity, and that is um, untrue as well in my journey. Um, as I was just describing, I worked two years, a month to month um, at a university. I was able to, um, uh, to obtain an internship for a summer at NASA Goddard, which was um, um, very interesting uh, during this time working uh, part time on my PhD. Uh, during at the end of that two years, I was offered a position with um, with a Canadian company, an industry contractor, um, and I decided to take that opportunity and still continue my PhD part time. Um, and while I was working for the contractor, um, still working on my PhD, I had my second son. And a couple of things happened during this period. The company that I worked for um, told me point blank that th that the PhD that I was pursuing so diligently on my own on a part-time basis had no value to them. And this was a very disheartening message to send uh, to me. So I, I sought out a trusted colleague of mine, somebody that I really respected, and I, I shared this um, these comments with him. And what he told me is that a PhD will, um, you know, you will never go wrong obtaining your PhD and you will never regret um, uh, obtaining that uh, that degree. And those words um, really made a difference to me, those encouraging words. And I um, continued to pursue my PhD. And, and obviously, I, I managed to finish um, as well. I worked three years as this industry contractor, still working on my PhD. Um, then I was hired um, with the government of Canada. And then I had an opportunity to get reclassified once I finished the PhD into a research scientist. Um, and naively, I asked my boss whether applying for um, this science position uh, was worthwhile. Um, and it was really the second best advice I ever got, which is absolutely um, apply for that. Um, so I, I worked um, at that time at the Canada Center for Remote Sensing, and then I transferred in 2003 to Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So I apologize. That was a long um, uh story walking you through my um, uh, my career and how I got where I am today. And so what is the lesson that I'm trying to share with you? Um, there's a couple of things that I want you to take away from, um, from this. 
One is to follow your passion. You know, as I mentioned to you, you know, when I started working month to month at the university, I really loved what I did. I really loved the science and discovering things every day. And it is imperative that you love what you do. I have two adult sons right now, and I tell them the exact same thing. Pick something in your life that that you are passionate about and pursue that. The other message that I'm trying to convey here is that not everybody knows their path. So you see this, this road sign. This is the path that I took. Um, as I was saying, I didn't set out to be a scientist. I didn't set out to be in remote sensing. I didn't set out to become a government scientist. And yet here I am. And so if you don't quite know what your path is, um, I, I just want to provide the message to you that you will find your way. I've, as I was saying, I've mentioned this to uh, repeatedly to my my sons um, and to other um, colleagues that I have, and I tell them, follow your passion and you will find your route. Okay, moving on to lesson number two. So I mentioned earlier on that, you know, sometimes we get to do great things in our career, um, but that science is a bit of a a slog, um, a bit of an incremental um, movement forward, one step at a time. And the other lesson is that not every day is going to be a great day. And what I want you to think about is to build your skills and have confidence in yourself. And I know that sounds easy to do, but let me show you some examples of that. So the thing when when we're applying for jobs, I, I hire a lot of people for my team uh, and I provide a lot of recommendations and um, references for, for others. So we really focus on these hard skills. So of course, these hard skills are very important. So in my field, for example, when we're hiring, we're looking for skills um, such as image processing, uh, maybe experience in modeling and algorithm development, um, programming language skills, um, even skills in how to collect data in the field. But the thing that I always um, think about is that these skills, um, as important as they are, they can be learned. So for example, if you don't have experience collecting data in the field with particular instruments, this is something that I can teach you. So many of these hard skills can be um, uh, can be applied. Um, through uh, through different learning opportunities. Soft skills are critically important. And when I hire individuals, I really focus a lot on these soft skills. So these are personality attributes that are really critical. And from my experience, the success of science teams depends on members having these skills. So for example, you need to be a good team player. That means that you get along with other people in the team, that you're willing to jump in and help if other team members uh, need that. Um, as well, you need to show initiative. And so what does that mean? I don't have the time as a team lead to be looking over your shoulder um, every moment of every day to direct what you should be doing. Um, and going along with that is are these uh, skills in problem solving. So if you uh, run into a problem, it's really important that um, you use some critical thinking to try to find solutions to that problem. I say to my team, for example, um, you know, take the initiative to solve the problems. If you need to come to me, um, that's fine, but don't come to me with, with only problems, come to me with solutions. And as well, of course, it's really important in your science career to show integrity. So if we think about science and building, I always think about building our science, our, our, our body of science as uh, uh, somewhat similar to building a house. So one brick at a time, as I've said before. Um, but each big brick has to, be, has to be placed in that house with integrity. So what do I mean by that? So it's really important that our science publications, for example, are of high quality. It means that... Um, we analyze our data with integrity. We don't remove data because they don't fit with our hypothesis. Um, and if we put faulty bricks in our house, especially at the foundation of it, um, it's really doing a disservice to the science community. So make sure that everything that you do, um, that you do with integrity. And your reputation is critically important. It takes a very long time to build your reputation and it 
typically happens one incremental step at a time. So what I mean by that is that your reputation is built um, through one publication at a time, one presentation at a time, even one conversation at a time. And it can take a moment to destroy that. Um, so be very careful and very guarded with your reputation. As I mentioned, integrity is, is critical and make sure that you create networks um, so that you can uh, connect with people who are going to um, open up those doors for you and provide you with um, you know, really great career advice as well. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit here about um, missed opportunities. Um, so a career can be punctuated with many disappointments. Um, and it, I want to emphasize here that this happens to all of us. And this has happened uh, to me on many occasions. So, for example, perhaps you applied for an award, a grant or a scholarship and you didn't receive it. Maybe you applied for a job um, and you you weren't su successful at that job application. You might have had a really great idea for a proposal, um, put it into a funding agency and it wasn't funded. Um, and you may have written um, a paper that was rejected. It's really important that we learn from each and every one of these failures because it makes us wiser. Um, and we need to embrace these disappointments because they provide us with opportunities to grow. I talk with my team about this. You know, when you get responses back from a reviewer, of course, some of those responses are off the mark. And so not everything a reviewer tells us, um, you know, is 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 really a fair, um, a fair criticism of the science that we've done. But embrace the comments and the recommendations from reviewers um, to make the paper better. It will become a stronger paper. The same thing applies for proposals or job applications. Learn from the feedback that you get from that um, and you know, dig into it the next time and, and learn from some of those comments that have been provided to you. So I tell my, um, my team um, to think like a cat. And I've had, um, over my years, I've had individuals in my office um, really upset because of some of these um, disappointments that they've had. And I have told them um, the same thing, think like a cat. So I'm a cat person. I have a couple cats of my own. Um, and if you know cats, um, you know that if you drop them, they will always land on their feet. And this is what I tell um, all of the individuals who uh, are on my team or who've come to me with disappointments. So you need to have faith in the skills. So those are the skills I just talked about, the hard skills, the soft skills, and your reputation. And one setback does not define your career. You know, have faith in all of those skills um, and you're going to land on your feet. And I've seen this repeatedly. Um, that these individuals, um, you know, they they take this at heart, they embrace these these uh, these criticisms and these suggestions and comments, and they go on to do tremendous things. Uh, the the next lesson that I want to talk to you about is to dream big, and uh, I I really love this saying that you miss one hundred percent of the opportunities that you don't attempt. And dreaming big can be um, a very intimidating um, experience. Uh, it can be scary to present new ideas, um, especially if they're challenging our existing understanding or they, they appear to be um, bigger than life. I mentioned to you that I have two sons. Um, one, my youngest son is, is in the field of science and I tell him this repeatedly, think outside of the box. And 99% of those ideas may not take a foothold and one may be brilliant. Um, but you have to be, you know, you have to be brave to do that. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, advancements in science are built incrementally. Most of what science advancement is, is like that one brick at a time, one step at a time, one, one small discovery, incremental improvement at a time. But we also need big steps. And these big steps are um, that we need, you know, they require bold ideas and brave hearts. Uh, for the senior scientists out there, um, you know, think about creating a safe space for young scientists um, to be comfortable in presenting these ideas, because it does take courage to do that. 
And I want to share one very specific example. Um, I told you some of these are lessons that I've learned myself. Um, I had the pleasure um, over a number of years to know Professor um, Wolfgang Berner. Um, so he is was a pioneer in the field of um, radar, particularly in polarimetric radar. Um, he was repeatedly and passionately um, advocating that we have to build radar systems that are, are capable of simultaneously collecting uh, data using multiple frequencies. Um, but that wasn't a, a bold enough um, vision for Dr. Um, uh, Berner. He also thought these systems should be fully polymetric and as well capable of um, interferometry. So um, I had the opportunity to hear Professor Berner um, talk about this many times um, at conferences. And you could see in the audience rumblings of, um, you know, people would, um, would whisper, they would roll their eyes, and they were thinking about, you know, this is just, you know, out there. They're, from an engineering perspective, from a data volume perspective, from a... Um, uh, uh, you know, a cost perspective, this is just never going to happen. And, you know, I have to admit that I thought the same thing. I thought, Professor Berner, you're right, this data would be fabulous, but there's just no way with the engineering restrictions that we have and the cost that, that you know, we can build these types of systems. And I have to say that I learned from this experience um, that I really thought too small, and what Dr. Berner taught me um, is that these things are, we are capable of, of these types of advancements, these bold steps. And we now have systems that um, are fully um, polarimetric and we're moving towards all of the capabilities that he was advocating for. So I have to remind myself as well, um, and I, I preach this to my research team, that we have to continually push back against our insecurities, both individually and as a community. Uh, so I, I have a number of um, sayings that I have posted in my office. This one from um, Dr. Goddard, I actually put in my PhD thesis because it really um, spoke to me. Um, and so this saying is that um, it's difficult to say what is impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And that means that things that we never thought possible, they will be possible in the future. So, you know, um, we need to embrace that. I also found this saying, I have it up in my office as well, um, and that is, they say I dream too big, and you know what, I say that they think too small. Um, and again, we have to remind ourselves to be bold. And I tell my team, dreaming in my in my team, dreaming is not is going to cost you nothing. So let's hear it. Let's hear those bold ideas, and let's see, um, and let's not limit ourselves to what we are capable of doing today. I hear this a lot. I hear in conversations with colleagues, well, the current satellite systems were not able to do that. And I say to them, do not limit yourselves to what you see today. Realize that uh, in the future, we are gonna be capable of things that we never thought were possible. Uh, so I wanna share with you something specifically on the radar side of things. So um, a handful of years ago, I, I started with my team. It was started as a bit of a joke, I would say, um, but it's kind of uh, carried on in my team and that is our, um, our 10 year challenge. So what does that mean? I want you to take a look at this image. So this is an image of, of radar data. Um, and I want you to look at how beautiful this image is. So this is an image um, from Western Canada. And it's an integration of um, C-band data from Radar Set 2, X-band data from Terrasar X, and L-band data from the Allos Pulsar sensor. Um, so it's approaching what Professor Berner was talking about, um, multi-frequency data, not captured on the same platform, mind you. We're not even looking at polarimetric data here. This is just um, one polarization from each frequency. But take a look at the richness of the information. I started my career before there were any radar satellites in space. Uh, so we did all of our research using airborne data. The first radar that was launched um, in my career was ERS-1 in 1991. And it was one frequency, one polarization, one incidence angle. Um, so I think back to those lessons. I think back to those uh, ERS-1 images and even radar set one images that we uh, worked a lot on. 
Um, and I never thought it was possible that SAR would be so beautiful. Um, so today I choose to embrace those uh, that that vision, that that bold idea from uh, Professor Berner. And I've learned my own lesson um, that I was too limiting, that I learned that SAR is capable of um, much more than I thought would ever be possible. And I try to carry that forward and think about and imagine what the future could be. And I truly believe that in the next decade, um, multi-frequency, um, fully polarimetric radar is going to tell us things about crops and soils that we never thought possible. And this information is going to be integral to many of the challenges that are facing the global agriculture sector. Uh, this is my last lesson, um, and that is we thrive when we're surrounded by those who believe in us. So I encourage you to find a good mentor and and uh, as well, I encourage you to be a good mentor to others and to be kind to others. So at the risk of leaving anyone out um, from my, my journey through my career, I decided to name names and, and share with you some of the um, um, incredible mentors that I've had in my life. So you see a few photos of these um, mentors on the left-hand side, uh, many of them in the radar field, but not all of them. Uh, so um, Dr. Keith Rainey is a, um, uh, a pioneer in the field of uh, radar remote sensing, um, especially on the polymetric side of things. Um, I've had um, many interactions with Dr. Rainey, um, and he's um, demonstrated to be a very kind, caring, and, and compassionate um, scientist. Uh, Dr. Brian Briscoe, who sadly passed away last year, was a, um, a pioneer in the field of radar remote sensing applied to agriculture, but also wetlands. Um, and Brian was so passionate about uh, what he did. He gave me my, my first job and was a mentor to me for many years. Those of you know who know Dr. Rita Tuzzi, I, I worked um, alongside um, Dr. Tuzzi for many years, and he's been very passionate in um, pushing forward um, the need for um, high quality calibration and validation of SAR systems. Uh, I mentioned that I worked in hyperspectral uh, research um, for many years. And when I was at the Canada Center for Remote Sensing, I worked with Dr. Carl Stance, um, who was a pioneer in Canada in hyperspectral remote sensing. And Carl was so passionate about the field of, of hyperspectral for um, all applications, including agriculture. And he was a kind and compassionate person, especially when it came to uh, the team that, that he led. And Dr. Claude Duguay was my PhD supervisor. So um, Dr. Duguay is in the field of uh, mostly snow and ice as it relates to microwave remote sensing. Uh, he took me on as a PhD student, even though um, agriculture wasn't his field. And, you know, Dr. Duguay was there for me always at the right time uh, when I needed uh, support through my PhD. And the middle photo shows myself um, and a few colleagues of mine in the fields of Manitoba. This was in 2012 during the SMAPVAX campaign. And I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but um, there's a um, a scientist uh, crouched down. She's in black. Uh, this is Dr. Joanne Boisvert. Um, and I'm going to, uh, uh, in a minute, talk to you a little bit about um, uh, a story that I can share with you about the impact that Dr. Boisvert has had on me. So these are just a sample of the mentors that have been there in my career. And when I thought about uh, those who mentored me, I, I thought, you know, what are the common commonalities among these mentors? And as I've already, um, you know, talked to you about, these mentors were, were passionate about what they did. Um, they were very, very dedicated uh, scientists. They worked hard um, to advance the science. They were clearly leaders in their field. And as I suggested as well, these were caring individuals. Um, they cared about the science, but they also cared about uh, the community and they cared about their team. Um, so my mentors probably never knew the impact that they had on me. Um, and I want to tell this story about uh, Dr. Uh, Boisvert. So in the government of Canada, there are five levels of research scientists, uh, level one to level five. And in 2012, when this photo was taken, I was at a level four. So one below the top level, um, which, which is a research level, uh, research scientist level five. 
Um, so this is a soybean field in, in Manitoba. Uh, Dr. Bravere always loved to be out in the field. Um, at this time in 2012, um, she was a, um, a director, a supervisor at Agriculture Canada. Um, and as we were walking out of this uh, soybean field, I hadn't seen her in a while. And she was asking me how things were going, um, how the science was going, how I was doing. Um, and she said something to me. She said, Heather, if, uh, if you want to apply for um, a promotion to the Res 5 category, which is the highest classification, she said, you have everything it takes to be a Res 5. And I was actually quite shocked that she would um, say that to me, um, that she would be, um, that she would even think of me in that capacity, because reaching a level five is an incredibly difficult um, thing to do in the government of Canada. Um, so uh, a few years later, about six years later, the op I, I, I considered when the call for promotion came out applying, and I thought about what Dr. Boravier said to me. And what she said to me, these words of encouragement helped me um, have confidence that um, that I should at least make the attempt to apply for this promotion. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm humbled to say that I applied and, and I was um, promoted. And it's these words of encouragement from mentors um, that, as I said, probably never knew the impact that they had on me um, that that provides this level of encouragement. So they don't just ins they haven't just inspired me in terms of the research, but their words and actions have let me know that they believed in me, um, and they've said the right things at the right time. They've lifted my spirits. They've inspired me, and they've built my confidence. So mentoring is critically important, um, and one person can make a difference. I've just outlined you know several people who made tremendous impacts on me in my career. Role modeling and mentoring is hugely important in science. We all need mentors, um, and this is profoundly obvious for, for young women um, and racialized communities that they have um, role models and mentors. And I would really like the dialogue, especially for young girls and women um, or, uh, uh, or racialized communities as well, that this dialogue that we have inside of ourselves, I want that to change from, I wonder if I could be a scientist to why, would I, why wouldn't I be a scientist? So I want you to think about this, your presence, so visibility in women in science, um, visibility in racialized communities, role modeling, and words of encouragement through things like mentoring can have profound in, um, impacts. Um, and those of you know me know I'm I'm very passionate as well about um, um, embracing and encouraging diversity. Um, so this is diversity of thought. This is diversity related to gender, related to ethnicity, uh, related to to age. Um, that when we have diverse science teams they make the best decisions and they deliver the best science. So I wanna close with this. Um, I wanna put a, a plug in for um, um, the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society's Women Mentoring Women program. And I just talked about how important that mentoring has been to me um, and that it has really at points in my career um, made a huge difference for me. Uh, so IEEE GRSS through the IDEA committee um, who is sponsoring this, uh, this webinar uh, runs a women mentoring women program and they deliver it through various means. So there are, there's um, an opportunity for one-on-one -on -one mentoring. So I've, I've done um, this a couple of times. I've had a couple of mentees through this program. Um, I met, meet with my mentee once a month and we talk about everything. Uh, sometimes we talk about life. We talk about what's happening in their personal life. We talk about what they did on vacation. And then sometimes we talk about their research. You know, how is the PhD or the master's going? Um, you know, how is that new job um, turning out? Um, and it's been, a, you know, really, really enlightening experience, even for me to be inspired by some of these incredible young women who I've had the pleasure to, to mentor. Uh, the program also provides skill building and professional workshops. Um, so this is more of a cohort experience where, where all mentors and mentees can come together um, to learn skills. So these could be um, profes professional or personal skills. So for example, you know, how to write a good proposal. 
Um, and the IDEA committee through the Women Mentoring Women program also provides um, computing, uh, community building and, and networking opportunities. So there are virtual meet meetups. Um, and if you go to um, GRSS's IGARS conference, you know as well that they um, deliver a number of different programs there, such as the Women in Geoscience Luncheon um, and other um, events during uh, these conferences. So my last slide here, um, I just want to uh, provide you with all the information that if you're interested in becoming a mentor or becoming a mentee, um, you can connect with Margot Fleming. She is a incredible dynamic um, a part of our IDEA team, um, and she's leading this initiative um, on mentoring. So you can email um, Margot directly, or you can go to the GRSS website, and the link is here, um, and sign up to become a, a mentor or a mentee. Um, so with that, I think I will close. I'm happy to answer technical questions if anybody has them, um, but I'm also um, open to talk about uh, anything that, that might be on your mind. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McLean, for your talk. I'm very confident that all, all the attendees have benefited so much uh, from the inspiration talk. At this point, uh, we call upon uh, questions for those who have any questions. Uh, the first question that was asked here was by Mary. I'm hoping uh, Doctor can see it from there. How did you cope as a mom and a scientist? Any advice for young moms? This is, okay, so this is a really great question, Mary. And, um, and, and I'm gonna give you a, a, a few ideas. Um, I'm gonna talk about it personally, and then I'm gonna talk about it as a community. Um, you know, so this was not easy. I had my first son when I was doing my master's. I had my second son when I was doing my PhD. Um, and, you know, on a personal level, it's really important to have a good supportive network around you. Um, so that could be family members or colleagues. Um, I had a very supportive partner, my husband, um, who, you know, who helped um, a lot when I was doing my master's and PhD, and even all of those months that I had to be, I had to be out in the field. Um, it is a constant struggle um, to be a mom scientist, um, to, um, you know, to have to be pulled in different directions, you know, you want to advance the science, um, you want to be out in the field, you want to go to the conferences, but you don't want to leave your, your little ones behind. Um, and it's also about, you know, kind of the workload that you have. Uh, you know, there's a lot of um, work to being a mom and there's a lot of work to being a scientist. Um, you know, really take it one one small step at a time, one day at a time from a personal perspective. So, you know, um, when I was doing my PhD, working full time and having a family, I took it one small step at a time. I tried to tackle one, um, one, you know, problem, one obstacle at a time, but do find a support network and do find that balance between, um, you know, family and your personal life and being a scientist from a, you know, a, a larger perspective, we need to do better as a science community um, to set up the networks um, for, um, you know, parents that that are also in the field of science you know so we're really pushing forward to try to find you know support at conferences for example so that you can bring your uh, your little ones with you um i've had several members on my committee or on my team that have went on a maternity leave one that just had a baby uh, two days ago actually um, and I try to be very supportive and understanding um of of their um you know of their uh um, you know, they're uh, growing a, a family and I tell them, you know, do not worry, you go off in maternity leave and we're going to welcome you back. But we need to do this um, at a community level to provide the support networks for those who are trying to juggle a family and, um, and a, a, you know, a career in science. It's not easy. Uh, the next question is from Fortis, where he's inquiring on whether there are any open access rider data in the market and whether they they can be able to, to work with the software with certain images. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to read the, um, the messages. Are the there messages. open access radar data in the market? 
Um, there are. Um, so the one that uh, that comes to mind is Sentinel One data, for example. So this data is um, free and open. Um, and there are a couple of portals. You can contact me later if you want to know where you can download Sentinel One data. Um, the radar set constellation mission, so Canada's three um, satellite constellation, the data is also open. Um, and you need to, um, you know, basically uh, be vetted and register with the uh, Canadian Space Agency, and then you can download um, uh, radar set um, constellation mission data um, as well. But the push for open radar data is going to continue, and um, you know, there's a shift in policy, especially from the space agencies towards free and open data. So RCM data. Um, and Sentinel One data are uh, free and 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 open, and you can contact me if you want to know how to get access to those. Um, the software uh, is another good question. Uh, so my team has, um, you know, been moving away from uh, commercial software to more uh, open access software. You, we use Snap a lot. Um, because it's a really uh, easy software tool to, you know, open and at least pre-process the data. Um, and Pulsar Pro is another great science um, uh, software if you want to do more advanced um, radar processing. So again, you can contact me if you have any questions about that. Uh, the last questions are in the QA. You can check them through, Doctor. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, for a young professional like me, these are the right words said at the right time. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Um, we all need somebody to believe in us. We really do. Um, and, you know, we need to be an open, kind and caring um, community as well. Um, I'm not sure if I see any of the questions, a few comments. Um, the, in the Q question and answer section. Did you want to say something, Musmi? Yeah, same with uh, Kasim is saying Q&A portion. Uh, yeah, you just want me to look through them? Yeah. Yeah, they are on the two. Yeah. Um, so there was a comment about Snap. Um, Snap is actually free and open, so uh, there's there's no cost for that. Uh, so again, if you um, need access to Snap, um, you know, let me know and we can show you how to do that. Um, the, the questions we are referring to are in the Q and A. You can tap on that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking yes. at the chat. Okay, no, at the Q and A. There okay. are two there. Hmm. I'm not uh, sure. That that I, I have posted in the chat. I have okay. posted in. The chat. Okay, that's better for me because I don't see the Q and A. <laughs> um, I'm curious about uh, hyperspectral satellite data that you use, and also what companies are you collaborating with to get hyperspectral data. Um, so I have to admit, I have not done uh, much hyperspectral research um, recently. Um, so a lot of the research that we did early on was uh, with using um, airborne hyperspectral data. Um, I think the one satellite that comes to mind is Nmap. So um, that's a satellite out of Germany. So that's a, a good uh, satellite to, um, uh, you know, to, uh, I think you can put a proposal in and get access to some of the NMAP data. Um, but there are some hyperspectral sensors that um, are going to be launched in the near future um, as well. So keep an eye on those. Um, yeah, so again, in terms of the companies, um, look to NMAP, I think initially that's the one that's up there right now and um, look to the future to other um, satellites that may be, um, other companies that may be launching hyperspectral satellites. Um, so how to navigate through negative and um, demotivating feedback. Yeah, you know, I this happens too, right? Where, um, like I said, that company said to me, um, we don't care if you do your PhD, it has no value to us. And this is why you're slogging your way through this. Uh, so I went to a trusted advisor and I, you know, I, I talked to them and I relayed the conversation that I had with this company um, and they brought some perspective um, to me. Um, so sometimes it means about reaching out to others um, and to kind of get grounded uh, through through them and sometimes um, to provide some perspective as well. So I've had lots of negative things said 
to me. Um, and that generally is what I do. I go to, you know, uh, family members and trusted colleagues, um, and they really help me put perspective on some of these, these negative comments. And, um, you know, we, you know, if you're, as we say, you're, you may be a person who looks at life as glass half full or glass half empty. And what I mean by that is that it's really, you know, we can really focus on the negative. So somebody says something, you know, negative um, towards you, it can be really demotivating, as you're saying. Um, but also think about, you know, just reflect upon all of the, you know, positive interactions you've had in your life as well. And so don't think of, you know, your life as, or these comments as, you know, the glass, you know, half empty, think about all of the positive things that people have said to you as well, and, and kind of lean into those um, and realize that, you know, this is, you know, one opinion or one comment from, from one person. Um, and that may help give you some perspective as well. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions. Those are the only questions we've had. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. We are really inspired by the journey that you've had and with all the lessons we've learned. We're really so grateful. Uh, over to you, uh, Mosmi. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Heather, for uh, today's presentation. And uh, as you have, you can easily see in the chat box, there were so many inspirational uh, thank yous and uh, they were very much, uh, and they have really enjoyed your talk. It is in every webinar series, we are giving two uh, student memberships to the participants. If anyone is a student member, uh, is a student and willing to join the GRSS uh, member, um, willing to take a GRSS membership, please uh, type your uh, interest in the chat box and uh, first two uh, member will get the GRSS membership for free from our site. So the condition is uh, type your email address. So yes, we have uh, Portis. Uh, Delianis and uh, Namutoshi Shahumara. Okay, I'll make a note of uh, this. Congratulations, uh, both of you. We will reach out to you and uh, for your membership. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you. Uh, see you soon in the next installment of our webinar series. Thank you. Uh, just uh, I'll uh, request all the panelists to switch on their uh, camera. I will take uh, one uh, group photograph. Uh, Mary, can you? I'm sorry, I can't. Okay. <laughs> no worries. I'll take it. Okay, Sunny, please look at here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you, Kazim. It was, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Feroz, for uh, um, setting up all the um, links and all. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank, you. Bye. thank you, Heather. Mary.